This is St. Anne's Church in the South Bronx, last resting place of Governor Morris, draftsman of the Constitution. Not a lot of tourists. The draftsman of the Declaration of Independence is better known. We all know what Governor Morris looked like from the neck down. This, of course, is George Washington by the great French sculptor Jean-Antoine Houdin. Houdin went all the way to America to study Washington's face. But back in France, he used Washington's young friend, Governor Morris, as his body model. Houdin had to improve his model a bit since Morris had lost a leg in a carriage accident. Despite that disaster, he was tall, vigorous, and handsome. He left a trail of lovers on two continents. How did he do it? Governor Morris, one young lady explained, kept us in a continual smile. Morris, the public man, left two monuments. The first is his work on the Constitution. Born and raised in New York, Morris had been living in Philadelphia for nine years, so he sat in the Constitutional Convention as a delegate from Pennsylvania. He spoke more often than anybody, even though he missed a whole month. No man, wrote one of his colleagues, has more wit than Mr. Morris. But he made his mark with his pen. The convention picked a five-man committee of style, including Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and Morris, to put their resolutions into final form. The committee gave the job to Morris. He cut out repetitions and legalese, compressing 23 articles into seven. His finest work was the preamble. Other delegates had offered their own preambles. Edmund Randolph's mentioned common defense, security of liberty, and general welfare. William Patterson cited the preservation of the Union. Morris wrote, We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. This flows. Notice the two rhymes and the alliteration. It also says a lot in a little space. Randolph's liberty becomes a blessing for the future. And the Constitution begins with we the people of the United States, not 13 allied states, but one people. Lincoln would pick it up in the Gettysburg Address, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. When he was an old man, James Madison said of Morris's writing, a better choice could not have been made. After his service in America, Morris went to Paris in 1789 on business. New York to Paris, seven hours. Only in 1792, he became the American minister to France, a post he held for two years. During that time, he was eyewitness to the French Revolution. His second monument is the record he kept in his letters and diary. Morris knew a number of Americans in Paris. The Marquis de Lafayette, hero of the American Revolution, was an advocate of reform in his own country. Thomas Jefferson, minister to France when Morris arrived, was a friend and advisor to Lafayette. And Thomas Paine, the firebrand journalist, came later on business of his own, but got swept up in French politics. Morris was also friendly with Charles Maurice de Talleyrand, a liberal Catholic bishop, and his lover, Adelaide de Flau, a countess. She also became Morris's lover. France was broke and in May 1789, King Louis XVI convened a meeting of the three estates of the realm, nobles, clergy, and common people, to generate consensus for financial reform. Morris watched the opening ceremony at the Palace of Versailles and got a sunburn. 
but the estates wanted political changes too. Morris was skeptical. They want an American constitution, he wrote, without reflecting they have not American citizens to support it. On July 14th, Parisians stormed the Bastille, a fortress in the heart of the city. A week later, Morris got a close-up of the mob in action, parading a dismembered corpse. The head, he wrote, was on a pike, the body dragged naked on the earth. This horrible exhibition is carried through the different streets. Gracious God, what a people! For three years, liberal revolutionaries like Lafayette and Talleyrand tried to establish a constitutional monarchy. Lafayette invented a new French flag, which is still used today. Morris occasionally gave them advice. He also advised the king. Don't bribe legislators, he suggested. They weren't worth corrupting. The liberal experiment collapsed on August 10, 1792, when the king was arrested and deposed. Lafayette and Talleyrand left the country. One night, a mob came to Morris's door. A number of persons enter, he wrote, to examine my house for arms, said to be hidden in it. I tell them that they shall not examine, that there are no arms. I'm obliged to be very peremptory, and at length get rid of them. He wasn't hiding arms, but he was hiding several aristocrats, including his lover. Jefferson, back in the United States, approved the radical takeover. The liberty of the whole earth was depending on the issue of the contest, and was ever such a prize won with so little innocent blood. Thomas Paine was thrilled with it, and was even elected to the French legislature. In a year, he was arrested himself. Morris had a grimmer view. Some days ago, he wrote in one letter, a man who owned a quarry applied to the legislature for damages. The number of dead bodies thrown into his pit choked it up so that he could not get men to work at it. In 1794, Morris was replaced as minister by James Monroe and left France, never to return. What had gone wrong? Years later, Morris compared France to a vicious horse with a cart. She may kick and plunge, but the whip and spur well applied will tame her. Some countries deserve the blessings of liberty, others don't. Was Morris wrong? Maybe, but we should hear him out. After all, he saw it with his own eyes.